the next session. Uh, this is a talk by Peter Frettenhofer from Data Robot. Uh, Peter's a data scientist, software engineer at Data Robot. He studied computer science at Gauss University of Technology in Austria and Bajaros University Wemner in Germany, focusing on machine learning on natural language processing. He's a contributor to Scikit-Learn. He co-authored a number of modules such as the gradient boosted trees, stochastic gradient descent, and decision trees. So let's welcome Peter. Thank you. Test, 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 does it work? Uh -huh. Okay, can you hear me? Great. So thanks, Gagi, for the introduction. Uh, so the title of the tutorial is uh, Gradient Boosted Regression Trees in Scikit-Learn. Uh, this is actually joint work with uh, Gilles Loop, but unfortunately, he cannot be here today. So uh, the goal of this tutorial is basically twofold. So first, I'd like to introduce you to a very flexible and powerful uh, supervised machine learning technique called uh, Gradient Boosted Regression Trees, or Gradient Boosting. Um, and second, uh, I would like to show you how you can use it in practice using scikit-learn. So all the material for this tutorial is available under this URL. Um, it's basically, if you go there, um, it's uh, github.com ppre.t, is my username. And then you can see it already on the, on the repositories. It's pydata minus gbrt minus tutorial. And if you clone that uh, repository, what you get is basically one uh, IPython notebook uh, and the slides. So the first part of the tutorial will be uh, in slides, and then I'll switch over in the practical part to the IPython notebook. Uh, so this looks roughly like this. Uh, so the prerequisites for the uh, IPython notebook uh, are uh, basically scikit-learn 0.14 or newer. So this basically means uh, so I strongly suggest if you don't have scikit-learn installed yet uh, that you install the latest master version because we made quite a lot of uh, uh, improvements, especially for the tree-based algorithms. And you might get slightly different results from what I get from, because I'm running it using uh, the master version. Uh, and if you have Anaconda 1.8, uh, then uh, you're fine. So it contains 0.14.1, I guess. Okay, so. Go back to the slides. Good. So I'm curious. Who of you has actually heard about uh, gradient boosting before? Okay. Oh, quite a large number, actually. So for those of you who haven't heard about it before, um, I'm pretty sure most of us here in the room have used it today. Uh, there's quite a lot of evidence that most major search engine providers use it uh, for web page ranking. Companies like Google, like Bing, uh, or Yandex. Uh, but it's not limited to this application domain. So in fact, it can be used for a variety of problems. And if you've paid, if you look at the winning solution to many prestigious data mining prices, such as um, the Netflix price or the GE Flight Quest or the Heritage Health price, you will notice that gradient boosting is a key ingredient in all of them. Okay? And uh, like, if you pay also close attention to uh, Kaggle competitions, then for me, gradient boosting is sort of the, the unsung hero of Kaggle competitions. Like, random forests get a lot of the credit, but Really, if you look at winning solutions, it mostly contains some way or another gradient boosting. Um, and just as sort of a geeky side note, um, something very similar to what we will uh, see now uh, has been used uh, in the Atlas experience over the last years at CERN, basically to, to detect interesting collisions in a large hydron collider. So it's really a very versatile technique. can be used for a variety of problems. So, the outline of the tutorial, I will spend the next uh, roughly 10 minutes on some supervised machine learning basics, uh, and then introduce uh, gradient boosting, focusing on intuition rather than sort of the mathematical formulas. Uh, and the second part of the tutorial will then be in the IPython notebook. Uh, we'll first show how you can use it in, in uh, the implementation available in scikit-learn, uh, and we'll, uh, finally we'll look at uh, a use case study on predicting housing prices in California. Good, so quickly about us. Uh, so Gilles, he's a PhD student at the University of Liège in Belgium. Uh, his research actually is, uh, focuses on uh, tree ensembles. And he's a scikit -learn developer since 2011, focusing uh, mostly on decision trees and uh, random forests. Uh, so he's the primary author and maintainer of the uh, decision tree and random forest implementation in scikit -learn. And me, for my part, I've been doing Python machine learning for about uh, six to seven years now. I'm a scikit-learn developer since 2010, working mostly on 
stochastic gradient descent and gradient boosting. Okay. So basics. So as I said, this talk is about uh, supervised machine learning. And as, as usual in supervised machine learning, we assume that our data comes at a set of examples. So basically pairs of x and y, where x are so-called feature vectors, which are basically like pictorial descriptions of the objects for which we want to generate predictions. So in the case of web page ranking, feature might be the number of terms in the query or the number of overlapping terms between the query and uh, the title tag of the web page, or it might be the page rank of the web page. The response y, on the other hand, can either be a real valued number, in which case we call it a regression problem, so predicting the price of a stock, uh, or it could be a mutually exclusive class label, uh, uh, in which case we call it a classification problem, like relevant, non-relevant, or spam, not spam. The goal in supervised machine learning is basically to find a function that maps from x to y, and we want to find a function such that the error in new unseen x is minimal. Okay? And this error is usually measured by some loss function, which is basically a function of the ground truth and our model predictions. And a very popular approach to supervised machine learning has been around for decades, or I think nearly half a century now, uh, are decision trees, and in particular classification and regression trees, or CART, by Leo Breiman and colleagues. And so a decision tree is basically a binary tree that recursively partitions the input space using uh, so-called feature threshold functions. So here you can see an example for this California housing data set that we'll discuss later on. Uh, so in this data set, the task is to predict uh, the median house price of an area in California based on features such as the median income in this area or the average number of rooms of houses in this area. Okay, And uh, basically, these uh, feature threshold functions internal nodes in the tree, they gate examples through the tree until they eventually end up in a particular leaf. And leaves contain constant predictions, okay? So in the case of classification, this is usually uh, like the distribution of the uh, example, of the class labels of the examples that ended up in a particular leaf. Or in the case of regression trees, this is usually the mean of the training examples that ended up in a particular leaf. And in everything that follows from now, we will only talk about regression trees, okay? So we only talk about uh, predicting uh, real valued responses with decision trees. So if you look at the kind of uh, functions that just such a uh, regression tree can approximate, so here is a toy example. So we have one uh, continuous feature x and the continuous response y. Uh, and so the, the ground truth is this uh, blue sinuate function. Uh, and what I did here, I basically uh, sampled uh, 80, tra uh, yeah, 80 training data points uniformly at random from x evaluated the ground truth, and then added some random Gaussian noise. And as I said before, uh, the leaves of the, of the regression trees contain constant predictions. So basically, the kind of functions that you can model with such a regression tree are piecewise constant functions. Okay? So the thick green line here basically shows you a regression tree of depth one, where you just have one split node and two leaves. So basically, you have uh, two constant segments corresponding to the two leaves and the band corresponding uh, to the root node. And so the deeper you grow your trees, the more constant segments uh, you can assign, which means the more variance you can, data, uh, you can capture uh, in your data. So decision trees are, uh, have one particular advantage. So they are interpretable. right? So you can simply plot them, look at them, and see how they derive their predictions. You can even generate rule sets basically from them. But they also have one big disadvantage, which is that they have actually quite poor predictive performance. Uh, so nowadays, they're hardly used uh, alone, but rather in so-called tree ensembles. And uh, these tree ensembles usually sort of average or aggregate a large number of, uh, of trees. Um, and they roughly come in three flavors, uh, random forests, bagging, and boosting. The first two are actually quite similar. They sort of uh, average a large number of sort of decorrelated trees. Uh, decorrelated trees are basically trees that sort of look different, so make different splitting decisions, but at the end of the day, basically uh, try to predict the same, uh, the same outcome. Okay? Uh, so bagging, for example, does this by ra uh, growing trees on random subsamples of your training data. Uh, random forest takes this idea even a bit more and basically also subsamples the number of features before uh, finding uh, a split node. Uh, and boosting, which is a uh, subject of this talk, differs quite a bit from the other two. So we'll see that in a minute. Uh, and basically, all of those <coughs> methods are available in scikit-learn in the ensemble package. Right. 
So gradient boosting. So gradient boosting is a very flexible uh, non-parametric technique that you can use for both classification and regression. Okay? And in my point of view, it really combines a number of strengths that make it quite unique. And for me, it, so in, in some sense, it's, uh, it's really very similar to uh, support vector machines, uh, k-nearest neighbor, random forests. So it's also non-parametric. But uh, from based on this uh, number of advantages, strengths it has, it's really for me like the Swiss army hammer of uh, supervised machine learning. And I really sort of use it for most of my predictive analytics problems. And a couple of those advantages are highlighted here. So first, they work uh, really well with heterogeneous data. So by that, I basically mean data where Featured are measured, measured on different scales. Like in this California housing example, we had the m median income is measured on a very different scale than um, the average number of rooms, for example. And it's in sharp contrast to other machine learning problems, such as predicting whether there's a face in an image or predicting whether a document uh, is uh, an, e an email spam or not. Right? Basically, our features are very homogeneous, right? They're either like pixel intensities or word counts. Second advantage is they uh, support different loss functions. Okay, so you can pick a loss function that fits your problem at hand rather than resorting to some kind of proxy loss function. So you can do things like if your data uh, contains a lot of mislabeled examples, you can do things like robust uh, loss functions, like Huberized loss functions for aggression. But you can also do very exotic things like uh, loss functions specific for ranking problems, okay, that put a lot of emphasis on examples high in the ranking and less emphasis on examples, getting examples right in the lower ranks. Okay, I think one of the reasons why they are very popular for web page ranking. And third advantage is they automatically de detect nonlinear feature interactions, so you don't need to hard code those, and you also don't need to inject some prior knowledge in form of a kernel. Okay? And so they really give you state-of-the-art predictive accuracy, but they are still not a total black box. So you can still look into the model and see how they derive, how it derives its predictions. We'll see that later. And in this sense, it's also very, very uh, different from uh, support vector machines on neural networks, again. Um, but as usual, it also has a number of disadvantages. Like many other machine learning methods, it requires careful tuning. It's also quite slow to train, uh, but it's really fast to predict. So again, I think one, one reason why it's often used in, in web page ranking. Uh, and the only real limitation of the method which it shares with other tree-based methods is that it cannot extrapolate. Okay, so if your problem requires extrapolation, you, you uh, should rather resort to diff different technique or like um, detrain your data first or deal with this extrapolation problem outside the gradient boosting framework. Okay, so boosting, what is boosting? So uh, as I said before, boosting is an ensemble technique and it differs quite uh, a lot from other ensemble techniques in the way it actually learns this ensemble, okay? And you can think of an ensemble as basically a mixture of experts, okay? And a boosting basically learns this ensemble sequentially, so in a stage-wise manner. But basically, each member of the ensemble is an expert on the errors of its predecessor. Okay? And one of the first practical boosting algorithms was uh, other boost for adaptive boosting by your friend and Rob Shapiri. And the way it works, it roughly iteratively rewrites the training examples based on errors. Okay? And I've sketched this here, so you have to read that from the left. So this is now a classification problem. Okay? The task is to separate the blue dots from the red dots. And what I did here in the first uh, plot on the left uh, shows you a decision tree uh, uh, that has been uh, trained on the original data, okay? So it cuts roughly horizontally through the middle. So it makes a bunch of errors, okay? You can see, for example, the three um, red dots uh, on the lower left side. So we now upwrite the examples we got wrong, okay? We downwrite the examples we got right. And now the second tree, instead of fitting it to the original data, we, uh, or we basically fit it to, the uh, to a rewrited version of the original data, okay? Now the second tree puts more emphasis on the upwrited examples, less emphasis on the downrighted examples. And we continue doing that for hundreds of thousands of iterations and the final model is then just like the aggregation of all those individual tree predictions, okay? So that's uh, Adaboost and we also have it covered in scikit-learn uh, ensemble dot Adaboost classifier or regressor depending on whether you want to do classification or regression. Um, and it was it a huge success so practically speaking, so one of the most seminal studies that used other boost was uh, the face detector by Paul Viola and Michael Jones in 2001. So I think it's still one of the most highly cited papers in machine learning. So for those of you who have seen, a, have had a machine learning class, you probably know the picture. 
uh, and uh, Freundin Shapiro, they also won the Gödel Prize in 2003 for their work on boosting and other boost in particular. And so this caught the attention of the statistics community, in particular Jerome Friedman, who looked on uh, boosting from a statistical point of view, and his major contribution there was to generalize this boosting idea to arbitrary loss functions. Okay, and the idea that, or the intuition that I would like you to take away from this is basically the one of residual fitting. Okay, it's a very simple uh, thing actually. So again, uh, we start here from the left. So here on the left now I show you the ground truth that this is a regression problem instead of a classification problem as we had before. We have one feature X and the continuous response Y. Uh, so you can think of this as like the, the box office of your favorite movie, right? So this sort of downward trend. Um, and the XX, the days after the, the, the movie launched. So the first tree we fit to the original data, okay? So we get the step function uh, over here, right? Uh, and so the second tree, instead of fitting it to a sort of rewrited version of the original data, we rather fit it to the residuals of the first tree, okay? So this guy here, we have him spot on. So the residual is zero in the second tree. Same as this guy here, residual is zero. The other ones are just relative because we have a constant prediction here. So the second tree is uh, then learned on the residuals. And you continue doing that for hundreds of thousands of iterations. And then the final model is just uh, the sum of all those individual tree predictions that we have. So and uh, uh, Friedman, he basically motivated this in the context of uh, what he calls sort of functional gradient descent. Okay? And so if you consider the case of least squares regression, so our loss function is basically just the squared residual, okay? Um, and so you can think of the residual as something which is proportional to this negative gradient of our loss function with respect to our cur current model predictions, okay? And so the idea is basically that you do steepest descent on this, okay? So each regression tree is just an approximation of this negative gradient, and then each tree is just a successive gradient step. So basically the whole sequence of trees is just nothing else than this uh, gradient descent procedure. And the neat thing of this is that now you're not only limited to like least squares regression, so this red uh, bowl-shaped curve here, but uh, you can also do, uh, you can pick any di uh, differential loss function and si simply plug it in. So you can do things like uh, this V-shaped uh, loss function here, which is uh, absolute error, okay? Uh, which, as you can see, puts less emphasis on uh, extremely uh, sort of, uh, mispredicted examples, okay? Least squares put a lot of emphasis on, on, on examples you got very right, uh, wrong. Um, uh, or you can pick like a Huberized version of this, which is this blue curve over here. Or you can do classification, right? So you can just pick uh, log loss, for example, in which case you get a logistic regression model, uh, so which allows you to make uh, basically probabilistic predictions. Uh, or you can pick uh, the blue function over here, exponent exponential error, which um, in which case you actually recover the other boost algorithm that we had before. So it's a very general uh, view uh, on boosting. Okay. So that's basically uh, how gradient boosting works. And now let's see how we can actually apply it in practice uh, in scikit-learn. So I will switch over to the IPython notebook now. That works. Okay. So for those of you who have the uh, IPython notebook, uh, I strongly suggest you actually run it now because some of the um, code statements that we will see later on, they involve uh, maybe downloading some data if you don't have it already. So uh, this may take a while. So just uh, like hit the run all. I think you can do this here, cell run all, and then it will, uh, sorry, evaluate all cells. Uh, so. I assume that, like, who of you uh, has not used scikit-learn before? Probably most of you. Okay, many. Okay, good. I, I still uh, go, like, to just a quick intro, because I think there are two other talks later on that also deal with scikit-learn, so I don't want to um, duplicate too much. But scikit-learn is basically an easy-to-use uh, machine learning toolkit uh, for Python, and it implements uh, classical, sort of well-established uh, machine learning algorithms for both supervised and unsupervised machine learning. And the uh, sort of informal rule that we have at scikit-learn is uh, if, if a method has at least uh, like 100 or 150 uh, citations, okay, then it's sort of eligible to get into scikit-learn otherwise. So we don't include research code and things like this. So it's usually really well-established uh, algorithms. And among its properties, it's 
Uh, one that mostly stands out is its licensing, so it has very moderate licensing, it's BST free licensed, so it can be used in uh, commercial applications quite, quite easily and conveniently. Uh, and so the, the, the core concept of scikit-learn is really uh, uh, the component of an estimator, okay? And I've just copied this from the scikit-learn tutorial, but basically an estimator is any object that learns from data. So it may be a classification, regression, or classroom algorithm, or some kind of feature uh, transformer that just extracts or filters useful features from raw data. And the bare interface of such an estimator looks like, like this, basically. So it has two methods, fit and predict. Uh, the fit method basically takes as arguments a two-dimensional NumPy array uh, and optionally a one-dimensional um, array uh, of responses. Okay, the two-dimensional array is basically the feature matrix that we said uh, that we that we specify, uh, and the fit method ba basically sets the model state. Okay, uh, and once the state is initialized, we can uh, derive predictions using the predict function. Predict again takes as input a two-dimensional NumPy array x, which is uh, the feature matrix of our test data, basically. And so scikit-learn provides two estimators for gradient boosting. Uh, one is called the gradient boosting classifier and regressor, and both are located in this scikit-learn.ensemble package. Uh, and estimators usually support arguments to control their fitting behavior. And in machine learning, they are often called uh, hyperparameters, okay? So and among the most important ones for gradient boosting are uh, the number of trees, so the depth of the individual trees, and the loss functions, okay? And you can specify those using these constructor arguments. So basically, if you want to fit um, a gradient boosting regression models with 100 trees of depth three using a least squares loss function, you can, you simply use the, use those uh, arguments as constructor arguments. And in scikit-learn, we put a lot of emphasis on documentation. So you find uh, uh, quite extensive narrative documentation on the website uh, on, on most modules, especially like gradient boosting. But you can also find extensive doc strings. So uh, in IPython notebook, this is quite convenient. You can just like uh, put a question mark behind uh, an object or a function, and it'll pull out the, the, the doc string. So here it, it shows you all the possible arguments that, and hyperparameters that you can set, and like some documentation on um, what are they used for. Okay, and. So this here basically shows you a self-contained example of how to use a gradient boosting classifier on some synthetic data, okay? So you can see we basically pull out some synthetic data using this data set generator from scikit-learn, create a training test split, and fit the gradient boosting classifier using uh, 200 trees of depth five to the training data, uh, and then you can derive predictions. Uh, Estimator.predict gives you basically the uh, predictions of the class labels. Uh, you can also um, get uh, predict in the case of classification, you can also get uh, class probability estimates using the predict proba function. This basically returns you an array of number of test examples, uh, number of classes, and then each component is the uh, class membership probability. So in this case, the binary classification problem. So the first component gives you the probability of the example being uh, negative. The second component gives you the probability of the class being positive. Okay, and also, as a convention in scikit-learn, uh, all uh, attribute, instance attributes uh, that hold the state of a fitted model have a trailing underscore, okay? So, for example, if you want to uh, look at the sequence of regression trees uh, that make up basically this gradient boosting model, you can find this in estimator.estimators underscore. So it's a two-dimensional array, number of classes, number of trees, uh, and you can see, so, in this case, this is a decision tree regressor object. And here is uh, maybe interesting to note is that the implementation of uh, gradient boosting in scikit-learn is basically mostly in pure Python and NumPy. So it turns out that the only performance critical section in gradient boosting is uh, learning of those uh, decision trees, the, those regression trees. And uh, here we use uh, the existing uh, implementation in scikit-learn, which is uh, written in Cython which is uh, kind of a Python C dialect, so it's very convenient to create extension modules uh, for Python in C. Uh, and one thing also worth noting is that it uh, turns out that training trees for uh, boosting is very different from training trees for random forests, for example. Okay, in random forests, you grow usually very deep trees and use lots of randomization, uh, whereas in boosting, you usually grow very shallow trees and hardly use any randomization. And this has quite a lot of implications for uh, the tree growing algorithm. So uh, 
since uh, the last uh, major release of scikit-learn 0.14, our decision tree engine now supports multiple uh, strategies to train decision trees. So uh, you can see here we use splitter uh, dot pre-sorted best splitter, which basically does pre-sorting of the training data before we grow the trees. Uh, this unfortunately requires a second memory copy. Okay, so you now need basically twice as much memory uh, as the input data, but it works much better for shallow trees. Okay, and so um, so this is only available in uh, in the latest master version of Scikit-Learn and will be in the next release. So if you run Anaconda uh, uh, 1.8, you will notice uh, actually uh, quite a lot of uh, quite a significant difference uh, in timings for gradient boosting. Okay, so but now let's see how we how actually such a gradient boosting model looks like when we apply it to this function approximation example that we saw before, uh, and for this is basically just uh, the code again that I used to generate this synthetic data. So it's just a senoid function with some random Gaussian noise. I go over the code; it's not that interesting, but just basically, oops, looks like uh, the result looks like this. So we have this senoid uh, curve, which is our ground truth. And then we sampled uh, 80 training data points in blue and 20 test data points in red. And uh, here is basically uh, the code that we that I used to generate uh, the decision trees. Uh, so again, uh, from Scikit-Learn, you can in, in a tree module you find this decision tree regressor. And you just pass the depth, the maximum depth of the tree, uh, to uh, the estimator, and then fit it to your data and we simply using Mapplotly we plot uh, the predictions to get these uh, approximations using regression trees. Now if you uh, do the same with a gradient boosting model, so in this case I use uh, a, a model with 1,000 trees uh, of depth one, you get uh, an approximation that looks roughly like this. And the way I uh, plotted this was um, um, I basically plotted the function approximation after I add uh, additional trees to the model and in a step, step, step size of 10. So these are actually uh, 100 lines, okay? And you can see the first line, it's, you can see it very hard, but it's, uh, it's this uh, light line over here that looks roughly like this uh, first tree that we saw before, okay? And you can see this is a very, we call this usually a high bias model. So it's a very constrained model. It can hardly can fit any variance in the data. So it can only model very constant functions, okay? So this, again, is a, is a low variance uh, solution. But as you add more tr more trees to your model, okay, uh, you can see the more variance in the data you can capture, and the less constraints you actually have on the kind of functions uh, that you can model. And in fact, uh, by using 1,000 trees, it seems like that we already captured most of the variation in the training data, and in fact, uh, we also already fitted quite a lot of the idiosyncrasies of our training data, which is this random no uh, Gaussian noise component that we added in. And uh, so sort of this is a clear indication of uh, a phenomenon that is called as overfitting in machine learning, and it's like the nemesis of everybody doing supervised uh, machine learning, okay? And this is usually the price that comes with model complexity, okay? And a very uh, important uh, diagnostic tool that you can use for gradient boosting to uh, determine whether or not your model is overfitting are so-called defiance plots, okay? And those uh, plots basically plot uh, the training and testing error as a function of the number of trees that we added to the model. And again, the number of trees that we added to the model is basically our proxy for uh, our m the model complexity, okay? Um, so and if you uh, look at the training error here, you can see um, it's uh, rapidly decreasing, okay? Uh, and sort of slows down as we add about 100 trees, okay? But still continues decreasing and as we had about 1,000 trees, it's sort of nearly zero, okay? Now looking at the testing error on the other hand, it also starts rapidly decreasing, okay? But uh, quite early it stops, uh, it, it slows down, stops, reaches its minimum at about like 50 trees, and then starts even increasing again, okay? And so this is this, uh, at this point, the model already has so much complexity that it starts fitting these idiosyncrasies of the data, and by fitting this sort of random Gaussian noise component, it, doesn't help the model necessarily to make better predictions, okay? So this is uh, a clear sign of overfitting is by just looking at those plots and if you can see a large gap between a training and testing error, that's a clear sign of overfitting, okay? What's the error scale? Uh, right, so this, uh, in this case, I use uh, uh, 
root means uh, no, it's mean square error. Good. Uh, and one of the key advantages of gradient boosting uh, versus, uh, for example, uh, random forest is that it gives you actually very fine grain control uh, of overfeeding. And it does that using, there are basically three kinds of knobs that you can turn in a gradient boosting model to, con uh, to control this overfeeding behavior. And uh, setting those knobs correctly is actually like the key in applying this uh, successfully in practice. And uh, I've grouped them in uh, into the tree structure, the shrinkage, and uh, something which is called stochastic gradient boosting. And I will now uh, like go over those because they are qu really quite important. So the first one is the tree structure. So basically here, um, as I said, uh, the, sorry, the, um, the number of trees in a model is one aspect of model complexity, but also the depth of the individual trees. Okay, it's just intuitively, this makes sense because the, the, the more trees we have and the deeper the trees are, the more sort of terms we have in the model and the more complex. Uh, is the model. And it uh, turns out that the maximum depth of the individual trees control the degree of feature interactions that we can model, okay? So if you want to, for example, model the uh, interaction between, for example, latitude and longitude, you need at least a tree of depth two in order to accommodate this. So you need one uh, tree node that splits on latitude uh, and another one below that splits on longitude or vice versa, okay? But uh, unfortunately, you usually don't know the degree of feature interactions in advance but it's usually fine to assume that it's kind of fairly low, okay? So usually, like Friedman proposes um, an interaction depth of uh, four to five. I usually hardly go deeper than an interaction depth of six, okay? And by basically increasing this maximum depth constraint on your trees, you also, like, it's, it's again like a, a, a runtime uh, trade-off, so you definitely pay in, in runtime. And this is a tactic that allows you to uh, increase the variance of your model, okay? You, if you see your model is sort of underfitting your data, then you might consider using uh, increasing the, uh, the maximum depth uh, of your trees. Okay. Another way uh, to control the tree structure is by using constraints uh, on when um, a node is eligible to be basically a split node. And one constraint that you can use here is uh, which we call the min sample sleeve. Okay. It's basically a constraint on the minimum number of samples uh, that have to be in a leaf in order to be sort of to make a split point a valid split point, okay? Uh, and this uh, allows you to, for example, uh, uh, restrict the model to not create uh, a leaf for some outlier nodes. So in this uh, tree, uh, in this function approximation example that we saw before, you could see some funnels that the model did in order to just like get some outliers, right? Okay, by sort of increasing uh, this threshold, you can uh, sort of basically restrict the model to, the, to do these kind of uh, extreme uh, leaves, okay? So this is again one uh, knob that you can turn in, in order to increase the bias. So if you see a model is sort of overfitting, uh, then this is one viable way uh, to fix this, okay? And I've sketched this here, um, so I don't go over the code. Uh, I think the, 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 the plot drives some of the picture. So again, we see this defines plot. Um, the dark blue and uh, dark red curves are the reference curves that we had before. And in addition to them, to those, I also trained um, one model using this uh, min sample sleeve constraint, set it to three. So the initial setting is to one. So it doesn't have any constraint on, 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 on what kind of leaves it can create, okay? And uh, as we said uh, before, this is one way to increase the bias of the model, okay? And if you increase the bias of the model, it basically means that it uh, is more constrained, so it has a harder job to fit the training data. So one thing we would assume that uh, the training error actually goes up, right? But our hope is by sort of increasing the bias of the model, we also can reduce some of the variance of the model by because it's still it's more constrained and so it can capture less variance. And we can also see that this actually is the case, right? So uh, you can see the test error, error <coughs> drops quite a bit, uh, and so the gap lowers between training and testing error, which means that this was actually uh, sensible thing that we did. Okay, so the second um, um, regularization uh, technique uh, that's actually really uh, important for uh, gradient boosting um, is called shrinkage, and the idea here is basically slow learning by shrinking the predictions of each tree by some small scalar, which we call the learning rate. And yeah, please. All right, question about the last slide. Mm -hmm. Do you Do you essentially rerun this on 
min leaf size from 1 to n. Right. Uh, yeah. So the question is how you actually set those parameters. And uh, I will come back to that in, in a minute, if you can wait. Great. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Uh, second. Uh, would it make sense, given that it's a sequential algorithm, would mm -hmm. it make sense to have the capability of changing the tree depth as you progress on the number of trees? Yeah, it would actually make sense. Uh, it's not currently possible in circuit learning. It, it, it would be uh, actually fairly easy to implement this. Uh, but uh, sort of uh, this implementation that you can see here is sort of the classical implementation, and it only supports uh, constant uh, sizes. So you mentioned that you can change the number of leaves based mm -hmm. on the interactions. I think yeah, the, the depth, depth, the depth. depth yeah, so the the that's important. Yeah, the depth, the depth controls the degree. So of if you find out during your initial data probing that there's two interactions, then yeah, is it like a theoretical result? Like is it one is to one, or is it something that empirically uh, is known? So uh, the the fact that the depth controls the degree of each interaction that's a fact. Okay, As okay. A, we can we can show that. Um, the way how you actually set this and how you come up with a sensible parameter, uh, I have again to defer bit later because that's actually a huge important topic but yeah yeah we'll come back in, in a minute it's okay good okay so shrinkage uh, very important um, it basically is um, is the step size in this gradient descent procedure okay it, we just make now smaller steps and as a result the ensemble actually gets quite redundant or a bit redundant okay so trees have to reinforce certain concepts uh, but this uh, um, so unfortunately, by lowering this, this learning rate, you now need to pay in the number of estimators y you need to learn. Okay, so it's a, it's a accuracy uh, runtime trade-off. Um, uh, but again, it's uh, very important. So I again show you here quickly the results on um, on the same data. So again, uh, the the dark blue curve and the dark red curve show you the reference curves that you had before. Uh, and the light blue and orange curve now show you uh, gradient boosting models with a learning rate of 0 0.1. Okay, previously I set it to 1.0, which is no shrinkage. Uh, and you can see now, in order to get to the same level of training error here, um, we need to add at least 200 more trees. Okay, so we definitely need to pair here. But eventually we get to a point of lower testing error, and actually much more important, uh, you can see that this model actually is is not. Um, we would actually need to run. Uh, much, much more iterations uh, and in order to get to convergency, okay? So the important thing is also that uh, by using shrinkage, we actually also, we effectively combat this overfitting behavior quite nicely, okay? That the training error is increasing. Now you can also see that the, the number of estimators as a parameter gets much m less sensitive to a specific value, okay? So it's definitely something that, that, that you need to tune uh, when you want to use those models in practice. So in the last regularization technique, uh, it's called stochastic gradient boosting. It's very similar to what we do in random forests. Uh, so it's adding some randomization in this whole procedure. So uh, it comes in two flavors, uh, either by subsampling the training set before you grow each tree. And you can do that using the subsample argument, just specifying the percentage of samples that you want to use to, generate, uh, to grow your tree on. Uh, or the second one is uh, by subsampling the features before you find the best split node. So you can do that using the max features, uh, which is the same parameter that you, we have in the random forest implementation. Uh, so um, they usually lead to better accuracy and reduced runtime. So you also, you definitely want to do this. Uh, and in my experience, uh, usually the latter works better, given that you have a sufficient large number of features. So if you have like 10 or more features, then definitely you want to to tune uh, max features rather than subsample. Uh, for this example, unfortunately, there's still there's just one feature, so uh, I could just use the subsampling subsample argument. So, like again, dark blue and dark red curve show you the reference curves that we had before. And then I have two more models. One has a subsampling rate of 50% and a learning rate of 0.1. Uh, so you can see here, um, get quite a noisy estimate on 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 the, on the error now. Uh, but we do get a lower testing error here. Uh, but unfortunately, as you can also see, uh, we now slightly get this overfitting behavior here that by making the model even more complex, uh, that the test error actually increases. Uh, and so y this is already a sign that shows you that the subsampling rate and the, um, and the learning rate actually interact with each other. So you definitely need to have some 
tactic to, to tune both values uh, because by just tuning one of those, uh, you might definitely change the results of the other one, the, the optimal pr value of the other one. Okay, so this is basically the topic now, which is uh, given that we now have all this pile of, uh, of hyperparameters, it's always the question how we actually set those. And that's usually tedious in machine learning, and it's where you spend most of your computational cycles. And for gradient boosting, I usually follow this kind of recipe. Okay, so I pick the number of estimators usually as high as computational possible. So this depends on uh, your hardware and your data set, of course. Uh, but let's say for our example, like 3,000, something like this. And then I tune those hyperparameters using uh, grid search. So the maximum depth of the trees, the learning rate, the mean sample sleeve, and these max features. Okay? And in scikit-learn, you can do this quite conveniently using our grid search API. So it's basically shown here. So you're from scikit-learn.grid search, you import this grid search CV object uh, estimator. Then you define your parameter grid. In our case, I tune the learning rate, uh, the maximum depth, and the mean sample sleeve. Max features cannot, cannot use for this example. Uh, you instantiate your uh, estimator object, and then you simply pass the estimator and the grid uh, to this grid search CV object. You can also specify a scoring method uh, that the grid search CV uses internally to find sort of the best model combinations. And then you simply fit it to your training data. And what this basically does, it sort of uh, exhaustively enumerates all possible hyperparameter combinations and gives you back uh, the best, uh, the best uh, parameter combinations. Uh, and it does that using uh, a cross-validation error, so uh, a cross-validation estimator. So it basically, uh, in a default version, it splits the data in three equally sized parts and always fits a model on uh, two of the parts and evaluates the error on the holdout part and cycles through those uh, three folds uh, and averages the results. And this is the estimator for uh, the, the estimate of the error for a particular combination. And then it simply picks um, uh, the, the parameter combination with the, with the least error. Okay. And you can access this question. Yeah, so yeah. I see that n jobs for is this, so it's all paralyzed all the independent uh, grid searches? Yeah. Mm. And uh, what about the learning algorithm itself? Is there any parallelism exposed? Because they're training forests, for example, yeah, yeah. independent yeah. use of data. That is a good question. It's always a, um, a haunting one for gradient boosting. Uh, so just quickly to do this one. Uh, so you can run the grid search in parallel. Uh, so it, it does, uh, it uses uh, droplib under the hood, which uses multiprocessing, okay? So if, which, which uses forking, which, in case you, you have a large data set, uh, you have the unfortunate um, happening that, that uh, it really becomes a memory hog because it uh, copies the data uh, in, to the new processes. Uh, so it's also, uh, like we also expose some of the underpinnings of this grid search CV. So if you want to, uh, if you want to use IPython parallel, you can actually use this uh, quite easily and hook it up uh, with this grid search CV. Um, so the second question was uh, gradient boosting itself. Uh, is it possible to, to run it uh, by uh, utilizing multiple cores? Uh, so the answer is uh, no, in scikit-learn not. Um, the problem is that um, we don't currently don't allow um, multi-threaded or, or yeah, any kind of multi-core multi uh, tree growing, okay? So in random forests, uh, those are easily parallelizable because those trees are completely uh, independent of each other, so you can simply do a parallel follow-up. Uh, in, 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 in gradient boosting, you can't do it because the, the trees depend on each other. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's definitely a problem. In the multi-class case, uh, there is a multi-class case of gradient boosting. Uh, there you could actually do uh, some, uh, some uh, multi-core uh, utilization. Uh, the, the point is that usually, like, depending on what you're actually doing, uh, if you, for example, are interested in, in competing on Kaggle competitions, then you actually really spend most of your cycles here in model tuning, which means that you can actually leverage your, your, your uh, parallel computing structure in the grid search uh, easily. Okay. Second question. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, so first question is, uh, is subsampling the same as bagging? And second is related to that, is there, uh, you, I noticed you didn't include subsample as a, in, your, in your grid search, and is there a reason for that? Uh, okay, so the first question was whether subsample, this, whether it's the same as, as bagging. 
Uh, and in bagging, I think you do sampling with replacement, but I'm not sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And in, in, in this subsampling, what, what I do is um, uh, without uh, replacing. So I really just pick a subsample uh, of, of, of the training data. <coughs> and the second question I have uh, forgot, sorry. Subsample is not in your script search. Right. Uh, yeah, because I, I hardly use subsample. I usually use max features. Yeah. But I should include it. Yeah. For, for this example, I should have rather included it, uh, this one here to be consistent with what I uh, told you before. Right. Uh, yeah. And uh, this grid search V object then uh, holds uh, the best parameters in uh, this argument, best params. So you can simply uh, set those best parameters and refit the model on the training data. And the result approximation looks like this. Uh, looks a bit better than what we had before. That was really ugly, but uh, this one still you can see that um, the approximation is actually quite poor. So you can see the uh, gradient boosting has a hard time fitting smooth functions. Okay, That's just due to the fact that we use these regression trees as base learners. Uh, so if, if you really want to fit very smooth functions, yeah, there are be better ways to, to do this. I have a question about batch updates. Can boosting support mini batch updates? Like, can you memorize the weight updates that you made on dependency trees and then go back to the beginning and incrementally adjust those weight updates as you get a new batch of data? Okay, uh, very good question. So uh, I think people un un understood it through the microphone. Uh, so uh, mini batch updates, so the problem is really the training of the trees, okay? So you can't grow the trees using mini batch as far as I know because you need to look at like one complete uh, feature, uh, yeah, feature column, basically. Uh, what you can do is something along those lines, uh, as you sketched it, I think uh, people try to basically, uh, you fit, I don't know, 10 trees in your, in your ensemble on the mini batch, and then the next tree is on a different mini batch, and, and things like this. Uh, people did that, to be honest, I don't know with what success. I haven't tried it myself. Um, might be curious. So if you want to, so this is more on out of core learning, right? If you're interested in out of core learning, yeah. It might be possible. Uh, so people use something similar like this if you have, uh, uh, if you want to update your model, uh, if you have something like concept drift, okay? So if your classification target, for example, changes over time, I don't know, the, because the vocabulary changes and you have some, some spam classifier, uh, then they add new uh, trees to an already trained model but I don't have any experience with that, so I can't tell. Okay. Um, right, and just as a, as a, as a side note to this um, hyperparameter tuning, uh, really a word of caution, uh, hyperparameters interact quite a lot with each other, as we saw before. Uh, learning rate, of course, with the number of estimators, okay? Uh, the learning rate also interacts with the subsample argument, uh, and the maximum depth also interacts with uh, the maximum features, of course. So, uh, like tuning one of those in isolation and then uh, fixing it and tuning the other ones doesn't usually doesn't work well, very well. Uh, so, for those of you who 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 uh, really want to get your hands dirty and and, 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 and and run some I don't know Kaggle competitions things like this, I strongly recommend uh, reading this uh, paper by Greg Ridgeway, which is basically the the guide to the GBM package, which is an R. Uh, gradient boosting implementation, and he has a uh, great discussion on, 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 on basically tuning and interactions between those hyperparameters. So it's definitely recommended. Thanks. Well, you mentioned you spend most of the time tuning the hyperparameters. Well, it seems when you run um, the grid search, it tests every hyperparameter against every hyperparameter, so you really have the max of the entire whatever grid search set. So what, what are some of the issues that come out after you're done? It spits out your best uh, hyperparameters. Hmm. Now what? Is it generally, is that usually not the best set of hyperparameters? No, no, no. Uh, that's usually, I mean, that's the, the best you, you uh, in, okay, so, so I don't know how, how related that is now to, to, to what you asked, but uh, in, in certain cases, so for example, you run the Kaggle competition like this, uh, you get number of, um, uh, of, of training data, you evaluate your model, um, uh, you do grid search using, let's say, freefold CV, okay? So you only train your model on three, uh, on two parts of the, of, of the data and evaluate on, 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 the, on the third part. Uh, now, 
Um, one thing is that the final model, you definitely train on 100% of the data because you don't throw away any data when you want to make predictions. Um, so uh, given that you have one third of the data more, uh, you could actually train a model that's more complex, that has more variance, because now you add more data to the model, which also means it can estimate those parameters better. So sometimes when you, like, for Kaggle competitions, I know that people, uh, like when they make their final submissions, they definitely crank up the model and make it a bit more complex because they, for a final fit, they have more data. But it's not something I would do in, in the kind of production system because you always need data to just like, reassure that the model is doing something sensible. Uh, yeah. in the case where someone learns hyperparameters and then knows that they're getting like a tenth more of data from the validation set in, mm. in their training set, like is there like a general kind of heuristic that they use to like crank up their hyperparameters? Uh, is it just like by, by play by ear kind of? Yeah, it's, I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just based on, on experience and gut feeling sometimes. At sure. least that's, that's my, but I, I don't know any, any heuristic. Okay. Uh, otherwise, except this, what I told you. How how noisy is the uh, the the space? I mean, can't enumerating all the different values is mm. not efficient compared to climbing and restarting or you know using a search technique, especially if you have a lot of data and this is taking hours to run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So have you have you looked at like the contour plots to see how noisy? the space is in terms of climbing uphill? Yeah, uh, so that's a very good question, yeah. So uh, how sensitive, it actually boils down to how sensitive are the setting of those hyperparameters, okay? So if you perturb them a bit, how, how, how does the model change if it sort of falls down completely? Uh, and, and that's actually a good thing is that uh, those parameters are not extremely sensible and, and all those have actually like some, uh, uh, some semantics sort of attached like you, you know other there are other machine learning algorithms where certain hyperparameters don't have any uh, clear clear semantics whatsoever I'm just thinking of uh, things like affinity propagation like if you know these clustering algorithms like there are some hyperparameters that are just like if you change those then it could be way off uh, here um, like if you change the learning rate a bit usually it doesn't matter much uh, so um, probably the, the, the one thing that, that uh, has most influence on this is the tree depth, because it sort of uh, uh, yeah changes quite a bit in the model. But otherwise, uh, no. I mean, I haven't I haven't seen a case where like there are extremely sharp contours. Uh, yeah, but I haven't studied it very very uh, systematically. So. Um, I have a question regarding the comparison of this method with. Uh, other methods like logistic regression, for example. Mm -hmm. So one of the nice things about LR is that you can actually train uh, multiple instances of the same model on subsets of data and mm -hmm. then merge them or aggregate them in some way. Like if you want to train on more data than can fit in a single core, you can train 100 LR models and then just mm -hmm. merge their decision boundary somehow. It doesn't seem like you can do that with trees of any kind, decision trees, right? Yeah. Or, or is there some clever method of doing so? That's a great question, but I would take it take it offline if, if that's if that's okay, because I think it uh, it diverges a bit uh, from what we what we did now. But it's a cool question, um, right? So, so based on what we what we learned now on how, how we can how we actually uh, like tune our, our GBM models, uh, our gradient boosting models, and <laughs> what those hyperparameters mean. Now let's apply it to some real world data just to see uh, to test. Uh, our skills sort of in, in, in practice. And what I picked here was the California housing data set. Uh, so I think it, it, it has a number of, of, of challenges that are quite interesting for, for boosting in particular. So quick outline of the data set. It, uh, so the task is to predict the median house value of census block, uh, block groups uh, in California. So there are roughly, uh, so it's the 1990 census, I think. Uh, there are a bit more than 20,000 groups. Uh, each one has eight features like said before, the median income, the average house age, latitude, longitude, population of the, of the group, uh, et cetera. And uh, what we do here is uh, we are interested in optimizing mean absolute error on an 80-20 train test split. And it's just to be consistent with uh, other studies that use the same data, okay? So fortunately, the data set is available in scikit-learn. You can just pull it out uh, using, uh, from the UCI machine learning repository. And here we just create 80-20 uh, train test split. 
So like I said, there are some challenges that make it quite interesting for boosting. Like those challenges are, first of all, very heterogeneous, like we have heterogeneous features, okay? As I said before, the, the, um, the median income is measured on a very different scale as latitude, for example. But uh, we also have very different uh, distributions, okay? So does it fit on the screen? Yeah. So, um, not really. so <coughs> yeah, here you can see uh, latitude and longitude have this bimodal distribution, okay? Uh, median income, very left skewed, okay? And this ha has quite some implications for some machine learning techniques. Um, we also have nonlinear feature interactions, in particular between latitude and longitude, okay? That's kind of obvious that it could be a quite an important thing to look at for this problem. Uh, and third advantage is we also <coughs> have some extreme responses, okay? So here is a histogram of the responses. Basically, you can see the mode is roughly 1.5. Uh, but we have very extreme house prices, uh, about four times as high, okay? So a model that fits uh, its solution based on uh, least squares uh, might put quite a lot of emphasis on those uh, high, extremely high-priced examples, okay? And uh, like finally, we evaluate the model using mean absolute error, which doesn't put that much emphasis on this. So uh, yeah. So uh, it, it's usually better to optimize for something uh, that's directly sort of the target metric. Okay. <coughs> and so what I did here is uh, did a quick rundown of some uh, methods that are available in scikit-learn. In particular, I looked at the uh, ridge regression model, uh, nonlinear SVM, uh, random forest, and the gradient boosting model. Uh, I tuned all those parameters using, um, using grid search and then sort of changed the parameters a bit just to make it run uh, uh, fast, so in, in, in a couple of minutes, if you want to rerun re, uh, re it here. Um, so you can see the rundown basically here. Um, like you can see, gradient boosting does uh, quite a decent job. Um, if you look at the ridge regression model here uh, and its error, that's mostly due to the fact that uh, ridge regression is really not, not a terrible fit actually for this problem, okay? So first of all, it optimizes for least squares, which is not a good fit for, for this data set. It also can't ha deal with uh, feature interactions, okay? Um, and it's also like, it's not scale invariant, okay? So we would need to spend some time on, um, on feature engineering and feature transformation in order to uh, make it work a bit better for its data set, okay? Now, so nonlinear support vector machines in, in this case, a uh, bit better fit. Uh, they optimize something which is kind of similar to a mean absolute error, like this epsilon insensitive loss, uh, but they do have a problem with heterogeneous uh, features, okay? So we would also need to spend much more time in, in, in feature transformations and things like this. You can also see that uh, support vector machines are, nonlinear support vector machines are somewhat slow uh, and especially somewhat slow at testing time, okay? If testing time is some, something that's relevant to you, then nonlinear SVMs are definitely not, 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 not a terribly good fit. Uh, Random forest, on the other hand, uh, is usually a very good off-the-shelf model Okay, you, you usually hardly need to do any, any kind of uh, feature uh, transformation. But again, this one uses uh, least squares at, as its kind of target metric, and which is not like a very good fit on this data set. Uh, for a gradient boosting model, I basically used 500 trees of depth four. Uh, and for this data set specifically, I use a uh, like Microsoft. A uh, robust loss function uh, called the Huberized loss function um, uh, that uh, is, is quite usually quite a good fit if you have data that contains somewhat sort of extreme or mislabeled examples. Okay, uh, but uh, actually um, this model is not very well trained for for tuned for this data set. And so if you look at this uh, sort of uh, defines plot that I show you here, so. What do you think? So, what do you what do you think? What, what are the hyperparameters that you would probably set uh, in order to uh, get a better fit on this data set? So, those of you who, who downloaded uh, the iPad notebook and, and, and ran it can try to fiddle with some of those uh, hyperparameter settings. Here is basically the, the template down there. Uh, otherwise, I, I suggest you can actually just look at the plot uh, and and as a hint, you can sort of uh, check whether you think you are in a in a high bias or in a sort of high variance regime uh, based on what we talked about before. You just read it back there for sure, right? 
Pardon? Yeah, uh, sorry, yeah, sorry, I uh, forgot to label the things. Red is so the red is the test error, error. Uh, blue is the training error, okay, as we, as we had before. So, no one? Good, so based on what we uh, l looked at before is uh, the gap between the training and testing error is usually a good indicator of whether the model is overfitting or not, okay? Um, and clearly in this data set, overfitting doesn't seem to be uh, a major problem, okay? So, um, in fact, if you look at the, uh, at the training error, it's actually uh, quite high. So uh, depending on what's your acceptable level of, of, of error on this, uh, on this specific problem, so in our case, we just want to optimize for the best possible score. So we, it's a, it, it looks, definitely looks like that the model is kind of underfitting the data, okay? So in, uh, a very good sort of general uh, way to start on uh, uh, when, you, when you just run uh, like gradient boosting model on, on your data is to first try to make the model overfitting Okay, <laughs> and then try to regularize the model uh, uh, and get sort of the, the variance component out. That's also something that you do quite a lot in neural networks. Okay, if you if you are into deep learning, these kind of things, what people usually do there is they they try to build a model that kind of all fits the data, and then sort of try to uh, use more regularization to uh, get to a better fit. Okay, so in this case, something you can definitely do is. Uh, there are basically two knobs you can turn in order to make your model uh, more complex, okay? One is that you can add more trees to the model. The other one is you can grow deeper trees, okay? So let's, let's try this for this data set over here. And here I also set the verbose option to one, then basically the model just prints you uh, the current training loss it has uh, based on the number of iterations and also the remaining time. Um, if you actually set the subsample argument to something which is smaller than one, uh, it will also print you uh, what is known as an out of bag error. So it uses the examples that it doesn't use f to fit the model to predict, uh, to get an estimate on, on the current error. Okay? That's something very noisy. I, I hardly use it myself, but some people use it for model selection. So you can use this in order to estimate uh, how many models you, uh, sorry, how many trees you actually want to, um, want to have in your model, okay? Uh, so here are the results. So you can see uh, we actually dropped by another 0 0.1, so another kind of uh, definitely better fit than what we had before. So I just tried to get another cell. and look at the diagnostic plot for this. So just got a quick question. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about um, why the random forest regressor with only 100 trees is so much slower in testing than the gradient boosted with like 600 or whatever you had here? Uh, isn't it, I mean, aren't there multiple trees in, all, in also the GBT? Okay, so the question was why was the gradient, uh, sorry, the random forest model slower at test? At test? Testing. Yeah, at testing time than the GBRT model. Okay, so the, the random, uh, like one key difference between random forests and, and, and boosting models, when you just look at them as kind of tree ensemble mo models, is the type of trees that they grow. So like in random forest, we grow very deep trees, uh, mm -hmm. lots of randomization, and in gradient boosting, we grow only very shallow trees, okay? And basically, the number of, um, cycles that you need to make for uh, for prediction is uh, just the depth of the tree, okay? So this is one aspect why uh, this is slower. Uh, the second aspect is that I spend quite a lot of time on uh, optimizing the prediction time on a gradient boosting regressor <laughs> due to the fact that I wanted to use it uh, in production for a company I, I worked before. And uh, testing time is always difficult in, in, in machine learning in, in these kind of applications also like you really need to ask yourself what are you actually interested in like do you want to make predictions for single data points or do you want to make predictions for patches of data points and it's hugely different and if you want to do the first one which in our case we wanted to do because it was an advertising setting and we were getting 
um, basically adds in and needed to match them to, to the user query. Um, their, uh, the overhead that you pay already for Python function calls is way, way bigger than what it costs to classify 1,000 examples in the C code that analyzes this. So it's really, uh, yeah, kind of depends on, 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 on what you want to get. Uh, yeah, Random Forest also allows you to uh, do um, multi-processing, uh, use multi-processing at prediction time, which also again drops through an abstraction layer which costs time. Okay, so this is some of the reasons. Uh, now this, uh, uh, this Random Forest implementation actually used uh, the newest master version, which I strongly recommend you, you use, so we make tons of improvement, Jill made tons of improvement on this one. Uh, and it also now supports uh, multi-threaded tree training. So previously this was not, uh, not possible, we used multi-processing, uh, which had this memory problem that I told you about. And this is now gone. Uh, so what we basically do here is we, we uh, release the, the, the GIL uh, during <coughs> tree creation. Uh, yeah, so that's definitely, uh, I'm really looking forward to the next release, which should be due to one or two months, uh, I hope. Yeah. Good. So, right. I just figured out that I actually learned the model using uh, the, the old argument, so it was just the same plot that we had before and the same uh, argument. So now I reran it using six, uh, depth of six, and so you can see now it's really uh, like better than what we had before. And when we look at the defiance plot, we should also see something which has much lower testing error, uh, yeah, and a larger gap between the training and testing error. But again, it like, seems like we can even make it uh, even more complex, okay? So, uh, right, we're already quite advanced in time. So what I uh, discuss uh, now is basically something very different. So in, in the beginning, I, I also told you that one of the key advantages of these gradient boosting models is that it allows you to do, uh, that it's sort of not a total black box, okay? So you can still look into the model and see how it sort of derives predictions. And one of the first things they usually do when you inspect the model is you, you, you ask yourself, okay, what are the important features, okay? And what, how do they sort of contribute in predicting your target response? And uh, in the gradient boosting model, this is uh, directly derived from the regression trees, okay? So trees, intrinsically make feature selection by choosing these appropriate split points. And uh, we basically use this information to derive these kind of feature importancy scores. Uh, and you can access those using estimate, a fitted estimator dot feature importancy underscore, which gives you back an array. And in this case, you can plot the array. Uh, and you can see that like, seems like latitude and longitude are very important as is median income. But clearly, like none of those variables is actually completely un, unread, ir irrelevant. Okay, so it seems like all of them are sort of contributing and predicting the target. So feature importance is uh, very good to get like a sense of what's going on in your data, uh, which ones are actually worth looking at, uh, which variables. Uh, it also can tell you something on uh, if there are costs attached with each of those features, uh, which one of them you actually really want to compute and which one do you want don't actually don't need to compute? Question. Is there a way to get confidence intervals around the importance? Or uh, in other words, uh, see if there's, is there a way to kind of quant quantitatively say that this, f this feature should be dropped? Okay. Uh, unfortunately not. So I'm not an expert on this. Gilles, he actually does his PhD on this. Um, so uh, I strongly, if, if you're really interested in this, I strongly recommend you, you get in touch uh, with him. He can tell you much, much more about this. Uh, there are multiple versions to actually do these importances for tree models. Uh, this one is, is just based on uh, the, the, the criteria that you use to grow the trees. Okay? There are permutation-based tests which probably give you uh, similar information to what you requested, but I actually, to be honest, I don't know any uh, uncertainty sort of inter intervals that you can attach to those. Uh, importances, uh, yeah. Um, but again, like this importances just tell you one part of the story. Uh, they don't tell you anything about how those features actually interact with the response or how they even in interact with, with each other, okay? And in order to do this, uh, you can look at partial dependency plots. And that's, um, gradient boosting is currently the only model in scikit-learn that supports partial dependency plots, but in principle, that's nothing that's inherent to, to, to gradient boosting. You can actually do this with any, any kind of model, um, but it's 
usually very computationally intense, but for tree models it's very simple to do because the tree is, is kind of a summary of your whole training data, and so you can derive those quite easily. And what they basically show is they show you uh, the relationship um, between the response and sort of a number of features you, you, you condition on uh, and marginalizing overall a lot of features, okay? So you can see things like, for example, if you look at the median income, at the partial dependency of the median income, you can see that there's roughly a linear relationship between the median income and the log median uh, house value, okay? Or you can see uh, that looking at average occupancy is somewhat a proxy of, I think, of, of, of how sort of s close to a city or how urban sort of an area is. Um, because like in cities usually like probably uh, mostly singles and, 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 and families mostly live in suburban areas. But you can see that uh, in those like areas where the average <laughs> occupancy is low, tends to be a higher, uh, a higher house price. Okay, and you can also look at two-dimensional uh, partial dependency plots, uh, like this one over here that shows us the house age and versus the average occupancy, and the partial dependency is just the contour. Uh, so looking at house age itself, it seems like it doesn't have any effect on the on the target response. Okay, but looking at this two-dimensional partial dependency plots, you can see something pretty interesting, which is that um, if uh, the average occupancy has a, a value of 2.5 or higher, it seems like the house age doesn't have any effect on, on the target response. Okay? But actually, if you are in an area that's, so my assumption is some, ki some kind of ur urban, so you have, a, you have a lower average occupancy, the house age actually has an effect on, 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 on the house price. And the older the house, the higher the price, basically. Okay. And so in scikit-learn, we have like a convenience plotting function, like basically sh looks like this. You pass it the estimator, the original training data, and the number of features uh, you're interested in, uh, and it creates those trellis plot. Uh, but there are also some uh, low-level functions that you can use to generate map overlays and 3D plots, things like this. So what I did here is use base map, which is kind of this geoplotting for matplotlib toolkit to plot the partial dependency of lo latitude and longitude. So nice thing here, what you can see is that the model sort of nicely captures that all other things being equal, house prices at the coast are higher than in the interior, okay? Kind of makes sense. Uh, and you can also like zoom into the Bay Area here. And yeah, I'm not from here so I can tell that. whether that's, whether that's uh, <laughs> something sensible. I tried to double check with Trulia, but it looks a bit different. Uh, So any question to partial dependency plots? No. How am I doing in time? Okay, good. Uh, so I just have basically two more uh, things to show you. One thing is uh, about <coughs> performance. Uh, so it's something that people are probably interested uh, in. Uh, there is uh, basically one implementation that's um, uh, where scikit-learn's gradient boosting model is, 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 is uh, kind of uh, based on, or where I looked very closely how, how they do it, which is uh, basically a reference implementation of gradient boosting in, uh, in R, which is the GBM package. Um, and so here I show you some benchmarks on uh, training time and testing time and predictive accuracy over a number of data sets, okay? And this one uses a new version, uh, again, the latest version of, of scikit-learn in the current master, which, uh, allows you also to create, to train uh, trees very differently in the kind of shape that they have. So GBM is something very special that's hardly documented. It's th uh, the way it creates trees is not as uh, complete binary trees, okay? Where we just grow them until a certain depth. Well, what they do rather is they grow the trees depth first. So they try to grow branches because at the end of the day only the branch is interesting. Uh, because it determines the interaction depth, and the interaction depth is the only thing we're interested in. Uh, so uh, the new version, current master version of scikit-learn also allows you to create trees in this kind of fashion. Uh, uh, it, instead of max leaves, it uses a different argument, which is called the number of uh, leaf nodes that you want to have, and basically interaction depth is the number of leaf nodes, minus one. Um, that being said, uh, given the fact that we have this feature now available, we get very similar performance to GBM package. Uh, 
because previously I got a lot of feature requests where they said, okay, I ran this model on CVM and it gave this result, and then I ran it in scikit-learn, and it was totally different. Um, so now they should give very similar results. So we can also now, given that they are very similar, we can look at the training time uh, and testing time performance. Uh, Testing time I wouldn't look too much at because of the problems we outlined before. Training time is more interesting probably because it tells you that uh, if you make only performance uh, evaluations on one single data set, you don't know, uh, you hardly know anything. Uh, so here basically the blue bar shows you GBM and it's normalized to one. Okay? And so if the green bar is lower, it tells you uh, scikit-learn is faster. The green bar is higher, it shows that it's slower. Um, and so you can see that the story is kind of mixed, okay? For some, it does way worse, like for example, 10.2. Okay, that's a synthetic data set. It's actually pretty small. Um, and it also, it's from, based on a like, random number generator, so all the feature values are uh, completely unique, okay? So we have lots and lots of potential split points, and it seems like the number of split points has quite a lot of implications on the runtime of the algorithm. But if you look at, uh, like, more realistic data sets like the Yahoo uh, learning to rank data set that was a competition that Yahoo put out on web page ranking. You can see that uh, scikit-learn is like 40% faster uh, on this one. And it's like a, a large data set, so I actually had to subsample it in order to make GBM run uh, on it. Uh, and also this data set here, Expedia, is again a Kaggle competition. It's also roughly 40% faster. And cover type is also quite interesting. It has like half a million examples. And most of them are binary features. So uh, you see there are only a few potential split points. So this has quite a lot of implications on tree building and scikit-learn. And it definitely seems like it's faster for data sets with indicator features, things like this. Can you give us a sense of how many uh, features are in these data sets? Is that why that maybe that big peak there in train time? Yeah. Is it linear or nonlinear, the number of features? Good question. Time? Yeah. So. Um, there are basically three characteristics we are interested in, uh, how, how we could uh, group them, the number of samples, the number of features, and uh, what I just outlined now is the number of potential split points that you can use. Um, when it comes to the number of features, then uh, BioResponse, for example, is one of those examples that has that is a wide data set but has very few examples. Okay, it's a couple of thousand uh, features. Uh, then uh, also Arkeen and Madelon, they are, ba they are basically synthetic data sets from the NIPS competition on feature selection. And one of them is, has very few features and a bunch of irrelevant ones and very large data set, uh, number of examples. And the other ones is, is, is just the opposite. It has just a few number of examples and a ton of features. And it seems like that that's not necessarily the case. So this is not uh, what, what drives it mostly. Uh, so the, the most of the difference, in my point of view, it's on the one hand an overhead that we pay in scikit-learn for probably some abstractions we use, and the second one is the number of potential split points that seems to be uh, problematic. Right. Um, two, minutes. two minutes. Okay, so now I quickly just go over some tips and tricks, <coughs> tricks of the trade. Uh, so uh, that's something that pops up on the mailing list quite a lot, uh, categorical features. So I only talked about numeric features for now, okay? But often, you have, if you have data mining problems, you have categorical features, okay? Such as the, um, uh, so this example I had was from a competition on uh, predicting f ar flight arrival times, okay? And one of the features was like uh, the, the type of the aircraft, okay? And it's like clearly a categorical feature, so there's no inherent ordering of, of, of the values, okay? So and what, you, what we usually suggest in scikit-learn is, um, is to use uh, one-hot encoding, where you basically create as many features as there are um, categorical variables, uh, levels, as there are levels in the categorical variable. Uh, but this usually has a huge uh, overhead then in terms of memory and in terms of runtime, because uh, tree growing is uh, linear in the number of features, and uh, it doesn't support sparse data yet, so creating these kind of indicator matrices is quite costly. Uh, but uh, it works really well if you do what is called ordinal encoding. So you just assign a random number to, to your level, okay? Um, and given that you grow your trees deep enough, it actually will figure it out, kind of. It is way faster and it, it works extremely. So I, I strongly suggest you, you use this if you have uh, to deal with categorical features. 
Um, and the second sort of uh, trick, uh, which might help quite a bit, is uh, I told you that GBM sort of automatically detects feature interactions. Um, it can definitely get some help. Uh, uh, it appreciates it if you if you add some some prior knowledge in there. So if you uh, have things like differences that might be important for your model, like in the flight comp uh, in, in this flight example, it was often the um, the current time of the of the aircraft and the schedule of the arrival. Okay, which tells you something about okay uh, how far uh, yeah how far off it, it it might be based on its location. Okay. Uh, then, uh, in order to approximate this, a GBM actually needs to do quite a lot of work. Okay, so this uh, on the left-hand side, you can see uh, if you want to approximate the function x, mi uh, x minus x, so one feature min minus the other one uh, using ten trees, it actually is a very poor approximation. So you need quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of capacity already to, to model something like this. Um, and here is a, a gradient boosting model, or any kind of tree, tree uh, ensemble is very different from something like a deep neural net. Okay, so a deep neural net could learn these kind of features in an underlying layer as an abstraction and reuse this abstraction in higher up layers. Uh, a tree model can't do this, right? So it has to sort of instantiate this again and again and again. And so it spends quite a lot of capacity on, on modeling these kind of things. So if you know that this is kind of important, uh, based on kind of domain knowledge, you should like make this explicit and add it uh, to the model. Okay, so right, basically to, to summarize, um, presented uh, like gradient boosting is really a flexible non-parametric classification and regression technique and it's really applicable to a variety of problems. So um, I've seen it being applied to uh, problems in the audio domain, uh, in web page ranking, even in uh, uh, distribution model for environmental niches uh, and we really have like a, a solid sort of battle one implementation in scikit learn that has been used in, in it's used in academia and even industry uh, and it's also quite heavily used in, in at Kaggle so I think there are at least eight competitions that have been won using uh, this model okay so thanks for your attention I, I was surprised mm -hmm. by that graph you showed about feature interactions. Yeah. What was was that artificially constrained to only be a depth of, of one? Is is that is that why it couldn't it couldn't find it with? Um, uh, for this one, I, I used uh, depth of two for the left one. Depth of two, and it, and it still couldn't find it. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. Do you guys handle missing data? And follow-up question is, what is the splitting uh, formula you use to decide a split? Is it like Gini index, or what do you, what mm -hmm. you guys use? Um, good, so to the second question first, because that's the important one. Uh, we, we, uh, we only use, like they're only used, uh, we, in, in gradient boosting you only use re regression trees. Mm -hmm. So no Gini index, but rather we use uh, variance. Um, yeah, mi minimizing variance, so basically, uh, find a split point where the two the variances of the two partitions that you create is, is minimal. Um, that's, but it's a very good question because there are many ways to do this. Uh, and current master version differs from the last stable release in that it penalizes um, imbalance splits more. Uh, it gives quite could give quite different results. That's the way the GBM does it as well. And the first question missing was data. missing data. Yeah. Uh, scikit learn none of the scikit learn models does uh, support uh, missing data or uh, categorical variables intrinsically okay so you also need to you always need to deal with them outside so in uh, I mean, what I usually do is median imputation what other people do uh, with because with median imputation you can sort of uh, trick the model often quite a bit uh, so what I usually do is like median imputation and an additional like uh, binary feature that just said, okay, was imputed, was not imputed. Uh, and but what other people also do is they just impute some huge number that is not not possible uh, in in the data set as such, like minus I don't know nine uh, e to the power thirty. Uh, and um, and the model will still like figure out that those are missing values and it treats them differently. So we don't do any intrinsic handling of missing features like surrogate features or something like that. 
Yeah. Um, Can you talk a little bit about uh, loss functions? I guess Huber does seem to work well, but um, yeah. uh, for the noisy cases, what yeah. might be other loss functions? So uh, for the noisy cases, we currently just have two of them. Uh, one is uh, least absolute deviation, which is this absolute error that we had before, this V-shaped function. And the second one is uh, this Huberized loss function, which is just like basically a, uh, a combination of the of the least squares and uh, and and uh, least absolute deviation. Uh, so based on uh, the quantiles uh, of your errors. So I think within you can specify that, but uh, within uh, the innermost 80 80 percent of the data you use um, least squares, and on the extremities you used least absolute error. Next. Uh, and currently, actually, we, d we hardly support any loss functions in scikit-learn. We just do uh, a, a bunch of for regression uh, and only one for classification. And But it's, it's very easy, actually, to, to, to implement new loss functions. You just need to specify some class, uh, class interfa interfaces, actually. Uh, and people are currently working on uh, adding uh, ranking loss functions uh, to this. So there's a GB, uh, pull request out there, and hopefully it will be merged in, in the next months. So. Okay, thanks. Yeah.